This is Cup of Go for June 23rd, 2023. Keep up to date with the important happenings in the Go community in 15 minutes per week. I'm your host, Shai Nechmat. And I'm your other host, Jonathan Hall. And this show is sponsored by Koyab, a developer-friendly serverless platform to deploy apps globally. Thanks to our partners at Koyab for sponsoring the show. Uh, stick around to the ad break to hear more about how they can help you deploy your Go stuff online to the World Wide Web. We have a ton of stuff to talk about this week. Top of mind is Go 121. But before that, let's do conference real quick. Yeah. What are you doing next week, Shai? Are you going to be in Berlin? I'm not going to be in Berlin, unfortunately. Yeah, me either. But a bunch of great people are, including the Go team. They'll be at GopherCon Europe in Berlin. There are still tickets available. And swag is available. So head over to gophercon.eu uh, if you are in or want to be in Berlin next week. It's going to be uh, one heck of a show. Yeah, and if I heard that they're going to record it and put it on YouTube, so don't worry if you can make it. All right, so let's get to the big news. Go 121 is out. Wait. Wait. 121? 121.0? 121.0 uh, space open uh, parentheses, one, zero close parentheses, open parentheses, one close parentheses, underscore final, underscore untitled, underscore final? Yeah, so Go 121 RC2 release candidate. So it's not official yet, but you can start testing it. There are a ton of interesting features, some of which we've discussed in the past, obviously. A min and mask, a max come to mind. But we want to make sure we cover all of them until the actual release, which is planned for August. Yeah. So first of all, go read it for yourself. The link is in the show notes. But let's start with what I think is most urgent, perhaps not the most interesting, but definitely the most urgent, the ports. Some OSs are going to be dropped. No. So the most urgent topic on the list that you should be aware of is the ports. Go 121 ports. Obviously, new operating systems are loved and old are being neglected and left behind. Any version of macOS below 10.15, so 10.14, are dropped. And Windows below 10 or below Server 2016. So if you have Go programs running on this uh, on these uh, systems, it's worth considering upgrading these systems or just sticking with the old version. But you're going to miss out on all the great features. Yeah. Such as... The new import ordering. <laughs> yeah, that's not very exciting. But it actually is kind of cool. I've had a bug related to this uh, that I found uh, with one of my recent clients. The TLDR is that imports are initialized in a deterministic order that's defined by the implementation. As of Go 1.21, the implementation or the the spec defines the import order initialization. So you can get subtle bugs if you change import ordering, uh, which happened recently, as I mentioned, at a client I was helping, where we renamed a module and that changed the the import structure. And uh, so things that were not being initialized in the same order. So now it will be deterministic. So uh, in alphabetical order, basically. Well, it's a little more subtle than that, but that's the basic idea. My main takeaway from this feature is that the Go linter that tells you don't use init, no init uh, linter or whatever, uh, Mm -hmm. is very correct. (laughs) Yeah. Don't do stuff uh, implicitly. It's just not worth it. Although just avoiding init is not enough because you can still declare package variables without an init function, and, and that still will take effect mm. in, in order. Although the init function is the bigger of the two evils because it can do all sorts of things. Yeah, Talking about stuff that is in 121, but I'm, I'm happy that it's there, but I'm not sure I'm 100% happy that it's there. Clear. So we talked about min and max, and I think that's really good. It's a very yeah. handy thing to have. And then we have a function called clear which deletes all elements from a map or zeros out all elements of a slice. And I'm sitting here scratching my head, wondering why. Um, For maps, I think that makes sense, right? But for slices? Yeah, I would expect a clear to either return or modify the slice to have a length of zero. Maybe keep the original capacity, but a length of zero. I understand, I think, why it doesn't do that, due to the implementation, since the slice is backed by a, an array, and you don't want to like allocate a new array when you call clear, I suppose, is the idea. But it seems very counterintuitive to me uh, from a developer standpoint. Yeah, it sets all elements of the zero value to... like It sets all elements of the zero value. So if you have strings, it's going to be empty strings. Mm-hmm. And my worst fear, if you have a slice of bool, it's going to turn them to false, <laughs> which is... 
I guess worth uh, discussing, but almost always try to use bool pointer just to avoid to have all three states oh. to have yes, no, and uh, I don't know yet. And undefined. Yeah, I can just imagine tons of code after this calling clear on a slice and then setting slice equals slice zero colon zero or or whatever you know just like we're gonna zero it out and we're gonna set it to zero length. I'm guessing this is gonna be a new idiom or maybe you just skip to the the ladder and never call clear on a slice. Yeah, it doesn't seem that useful to me. One thing we mentioned at the top, which is pretty funny, is the version numbering. Right, that's pretty inconsistent. <laughs> so one th- change in this, at least that's written in the release is that it's going to be 1.21.0. Right. But John, do you want to read me the title of the release notes real quick? So the release notes are titled Go 1, period, 2, 1, release notes. <laughs> There's no point zero. Now, maybe that makes sense because the release notes are meant to cover all of the upcoming versions of Go 120, all the patch releases. But even so, the release candidate is called Go 1.21, release candidate 2. There's no point zero in there, as I would expect. So I guess it's hard to start being consistent or it's a deliberate choice to make the title just shorter when shared online. Uh, yes, they're saving my bandwidth. I appreciate that. But if you talk about 121, you should say 121.0, which we haven't as well. So, you know, who's the real hypocrite here? Uh, <laughs> we want to talk about a bunch of more stuff and we will space it out over the next shows as well. So if you're worried that we haven't mentioned the new Unicode support for your beautiful emojis, type inference improvements, the CMP slice and maps packages that got a brand new coat of paint, and obviously S-Log, which we've discussed at length on the show. Don't worry, we'll talk about it in the future. Uh, we just don't want to make the show you know, a fireside reading of the 1.21 show notes. Because believe it or not, the rest of the world doesn't stop when there's a release candidate. They keep making other news, and we should talk about some of that too. Yeah. Let's move on to proposals, because... That process keeps happening. They don't. They have a code freeze on 121, but they don't have a proposals freeze. So we've had some new discussions and new proposals. Let's talk about some of those. Uh, what would you like to hit us with first, Shai? So one thing was interesting. I saw a discussion that was closed, which to me sort of says, oh, it's not going to happen. Something proposed by uh, Michael Matlub, I hope I'm saying that correctly, from the Google team over at New York, about allowing package forwarding, which is a super practical feature I'll lay out the use case instead of trying to explain what it does because it's, uh, I think, a lot clearer to understand. Let's say I wrote a super successful uh, open source project and on my personal GitHub. So it's like my personal GitHub is the core man. So the core man slash awesome project dash go. Right. And it blows up in popularity and I want to open up my company, awesome project co. Right. So I'll open up my company, then I'll open the GitHub, uh, whatever. And then I'll move, I'll transfer ownership to the to the organization. Mm-hmm. The import paths have now changed from GitHub, the core man, awesome project, to the GitHub, awesome project, co, awesome project. Right. Uh, same has happened if you move from GitHub to GitLab, or if it becomes like an official import using a Go package. Like what happened with Redis a few months ago, right? When mm-hmm. they adopted mm-hmm. the community driver. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so instead of breaking all the things, you can just uh, put a go forward like declaration that will just forward all the old imports into the new imports and the go uh, build tool will take that into consideration. The discussion has been open for not that long. And it's really sort of well written, explains everything. It has been open for about two weeks. They got, I think, all the feedback that they needed. The closing argument here on the discussion is they're not entirely sure what the right path forward. Well, they'll close this and think some more, which to me, I think, just says they got the feedback that they needed and they need to workshop it a bit more before it becomes a proposal. Obviously, there are a few things to think about. What happens with Go Mod Y? What happens with Go Mode Tidy? How does vendoring exactly work? Like There are a bunch of edge cases, but to me, this seems like a really good discussion that I hope to see as a proposal pretty soon. Anything we can do to you know make uh, not managing Go Sum and Go Mod manually, I think it's good for me because I hate editing these files. Yeah, uh, And we have another discussion that's open. Uh, we won't delve too deep into it, but we definitely want to encourage you to go share your opinions there about HTTP. What's yeah. going on in that discussion? So uh, anybody who writes HTTP much, um, whether you're writing REST or gRPC or whatever, you're probably aware that Go supports HTTP2. However, it's this weird sort of state that HTTP2 exists the experimental namespace. It's not part of the official standard library. It's part of the unofficial standard library, basically. If you're using HTTP2 and Go, you're probably using golang.org slash x slash net slash HTTP2. And we're in this strange situation where net HTTP, which is part of the standard library, 
calls this non-standard library package when you enable HTTP2. Anyway, the discussion is, let's make HTTP2 part of the standard library. Get rid of that weird relationship where the standard library depends on the non-standard library, um, and just to make it an official adopted you know, package. So I think that's a great idea in principle. Uh, of course, there are always questions whenever this happens of what did we learn during the experimental phase that we should not copy into the standard library. So that discussion is going on. If you are a, a user of HTTP2 and have insights, please join the discussion and, and share them with us. Yeah, you probably are just to, you know, I, in my mind, HTTP2 is still a new thing that's being transferred to, but it's actually being used by more than one third of every single website. <laughs> and HTTP3 is is out now also. <laughs> yeah, so I really assume that, you know, you actually are using it. Maybe you just don't know. So if you do, please go uh, contribute to the discussion. Um, and finally, to wrap stuff out, uh, we didn't have a chance to talk about a lot of community things uh, recently. Just too many urgent news. So we made it a point to do two small community things that are not that important, but are really cool. And the first one I'm going to take, we both uh, like gaming. You're actually a console gamer even more than me. So you're probably happy to hear that Dendi, a uh, Go NES emulator, uh, has been out for a while. Uh, it's a toy project. The first thing it says on the readme is... Uh, this is a toy project. It's not meant to be anything serious, but it's a learning experience. But for me, it makes it even cooler to follow up on and see the author actually releasing stuff. And, you know, just t actually 10 hours ago, he added an MMC3 mapper to the project, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but, you know, who doesn't like NES? I'm just really sad to see the sound title uh, in the readme being to do. Uh, so oh. if you are into any emulation, maybe you can go write uh, any sound emulator in Go. So a cute uh, toy project to check out if you like gaming, if you like Go. Maybe a, a cool uh, learning experience you can join. Awesome. Last on the list today is a little uh, resource uh, that I came up, became aware of reading one of the other Go Weekly newsletters. It's called grank.io, or maybe grank if you really want to stretch the pronunciation. And it ranks Go packages by their Google page rank. It also shows you how many GitHub stars they have and their ranking by GitHub stars. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting tool if you're interested in, if you're trying to find out, should I use package A or B? You could go here to see which one's more popular by a metric other than GitHub stars. Or it's also just kind of interesting to see what are the, what are the interesting popular packages. As I was preparing to record this, I was looking at just the top 10. The number one most popular by Google PageRank is the Testify package. I don't know. I, I'm a little bit sad about that since you know the official Go suggestion is not to use uh, external testing libraries, but whatever. A lot of people do it. But of the top 10, I think it's interesting to notice that two of them are about pretty printing Go values, uh, kr slash pretty and Go spew. Two of them are also about doing diffs of Go types, Go CMP and Go diffLib. And two are about testing. The number one, Testify, I already mentioned. And then there's Go Check. So that's six of the top 10, which are really all about how to test your Go code. That's that's really all those things are used for, for testing or debugging. So that's that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, then the others, uh, two of them are from the sort of experimental standard library, golang.org slash x slash net and golang.org slash x slash sys. Which totally then, makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And then the ninth one on the list, which actually ranks number four, is YAML v3. <laughs> yeah. And to me, it's really hard to justify putting things in the standard library. I and mean, we talked a lot about how the, the fact that the standard library is thin is, mm -hmm. uh, is good for, uh, for Go. But, you know, at some point you become from like a monk that's happy with a few things to uh, someone who's uh, suffering from not having enough. I've used Go spew in every single Go project I've yeah. faced. Just every time I need to debug, I need Go spew. That's how it works. You know, having Go CMP and uh, Check and Diflib all in the top 10. I think it, it shows something missing. And I think that the fact that we have like YAML here or Sys or Protobuf is number 10, which is my favorite. And Net, that's great, right? It's good that uh, Go's top packages are about interfacing with other systems, whether it would be the operating system or configuration files or like that's great. That's what I hoped to see being popular. 
but stuff tools for supporting the language and the language tooling i guess it's good that they're good there's a consensus on them but on the other hand feels like a pretty strong argument to putting more stuff in the standard library especially since it's about testing people are not going to use it in production code so who cares I think this makes a strong case for the proposal that was brought up. We talked about it on the show a few weeks ago, a few months ago, about making a Go CMP like library in the standard library, which was postponed. Basically, they felt it was too complicated to put in the standard library. And maybe that's true, but I feel like it deserves more consideration, as well as YAML. I, I'm a little bit surprised YAML isn't in the standard library, considering that largest Go project in the world is Kubernetes, which is all about YAML. And talking about Kubernetes, it's also up here on the list, which is pretty interesting. Here on the list, uh, you can go check it out. On the left, you see the page rank ranking, which is sort of this vague Google search algorithm ranking. It sort of says how many people link back to you ish mm-hmm. with some weights. Uh, and on the right, you can see GitHub stars, which is just a number of how many people go- went to your site and clicked. And I would say that the GitHub stars is a lot more of a popularity contest than the page rank, which is your actual popularity. And it's really funny to see packages that have really big discrepancies between the two. For example, number 17, KR text, which if you haven't used is about like just misc functions for manipulating paragraphs of text, indent and wrap and stuff like that. People won't go and upvote it, but it's number 17 on the page rank ranking and it only has 89 stars. It's not on the 89th place. It only has 89 stars. So it's like, I don't know, 15K on the rank by stars rating. Which I found pretty funny, like the discrepancy between actual useful packages and popular packages. I suppose the page rank also takes into account how popular a, a library is to blog about, which might help explain Testify's popularity because a lot of beginners are reading blogs about that, whether it's actually used in large projects. Although I'm sure it is used in large projects as well, but it probably helps helps that ranking. So if you have a Golang dependency and it looks great, but it doesn't have a ton of stars, maybe check out G-Rank to see if uh, it's just being imported by a ton of other people. To me, it would give a, a little more confidence because the chance of someone picking it up, sponsoring it, it becomes a little bigger. And also, worst case, you copy it, right? Uh, a little copying is better than a little dependency. And that wraps it up for the stuff we have to cover this week. For one other community-related item, stick around for our interview. We'll be interviewing author John Arundel, a number of Go books, and we've mentioned him on the show before with regard to some of his blog posts. So stick around for that. We had a great chat. Hope you'll listen in and learn from him. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Koyab for sponsoring this episode. If you haven't heard already in our previous episodes, Koyabs have been partners of the show for about a month now. They're a serverless platform providing developers, including myself personally, and businesses with the fastest way to deploy full stack applications globally. They manage the underlying infrastructure. You heard Jan here on the show talk about it. You know, you can focus on growing your business. They have a few things that, you know, you can focus on. But to me, the fact that Git push just, you know, they take care of everything. They're really performant. They had a they have a bunch of really good features, and I haven't paid yet, which is starting to feel bad because I already <laughs> have two projects there. Uh, but they're very small scale projects, and uh, they have a free tier up to five bucks a month with um, micro uh, servers. Last week uh, for a client project, I wrote a server. You want to go check it out? I do. All right. So what do you see at the problematic API server app? I wanted to cause some problems for the Koyab team. So I literally deployed a server called Problematic API Server. Uh First of all, does it work? So the Swagger page loads. All right. So you heard it here first, folks. Koyeb actually worked. (laughs) This was a live test. Awesome. Yeah, it's a learning project about uh, trying to talk to the server, and the server responds with annoying responses. Like, it'll give you internal errors. And it will give you four two nines with different strategies. So you have to learn how to deal with them. And I'm hoping to develop it into something more serious with my clients soon. And I did it with Koyeb. And it was super fast and painless. So we highly recommend you checking them out. And again, thank you for sponsoring us, Koyeb. What else should we mention? That's a nice cup you're drinking from. It is. I love this cup. And, you know, I gave one of these away recently. I had uh, We had our Amsterdam Go Meetup earlier this week. So I gave a cup to the presenter of the Go News, which is a segment we do at our meetups every month, What's New in Go. Honestly, I have to give credit to the Go Meetup here in Amsterdam for giving me the idea for this podcast, because it was that segment that gave me the idea of making a weekly podcast about the Go News. So thanks to the other uh, organizers there. Nice work, Amsterdam. And I gave away a bunch of stickers there. If you'd like to have your own cup with the Cup of Go logo, 
or your own sticker with the Cup of Go logo, head over to was it store or shop? I can't remember. Store. <laughs> <laughs> Head over to store.cupago.dev and show us your friends how you support the show, that you have adorable little gophers on, on all your swag, on everything, and make them want to listen to the show too. Yeah. If you want to reach us, you can reach us at cupago.dev, at the gopher stack, at hashtag cupago. That's kebab case uh, with hyphens. I realized someone didn't understand why it's called kebab case. Someone reached out with that. Why, why do you say kebab uh-huh. all the time? Just imagine... Like you want to skewer some vegetables or if that's what you think, some some meat and you want to grill it. So the skewer goes through the middle of the things and you have spaces in between where you can see the skewer. Just imagine us skewering the words cup of go uh, and grilling them on a grill. That's the hashtag. Or you can just start searching. I assume that if you search for the word cup in the gopher slack, you're going to find it even without understanding the etymology of uh, kebab case. And if you want to email us, you can email us news at cupago.dev. That is news at cupago.dev. If you like the show, other than uh, buying swag, you can leave a review on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts and share the show with your uh, co-workers, friends, co-students, whatever. Absolutely. Uh, Stick around to hear us talking to John Arundel, a super interesting interview about everything he did in Go and about why programming is still fun. In 2023. And stick around for his surprising answer to what he would add to go. Dum, dum, dum. And one last thing. Uh, Jonathan, congratulations. Thank you. It's our 20th episode. Yay. Woo. It's actually our 21st at this point. 21st now. Yeah. Uh, our episodes can legally drink in the US. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things we want to do to celebrate, uh, we're both pretty jazzed about this thing uh, going on and even collecting momentum, uh, is we decided to name the gopher. Uh, together with you all uh, and you had some interesting suggestions Jonathan you want to share the list with us we're gonna go through the whole list here yeah 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 we so have to. so we have Gofi. I guess that's like coffee except with go mm-hmm. we have Edgar Jerry Jerry came up twice actually I don't get so, it either <laughs> no, nothing wrong with the name especially any Jerry's listening out there but I don't see the the, the reason mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah moving on cuppers and go bean are some good ones Brewster one of my favorites not to bias the selection too much, but caffeinated Cody. That was cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it Topher or Toffer? T O P H E R? I guess it's Topher, like Gopher. I suppose so, yeah. And then some brave soul decided to send five of their own suggestions. Yeah. So all in one go here we have Joe, like Cup of Joe, Gary, Mike, like microphone, Von Caffeinator, or Buttons. So we went through this, and after an exhaustive selection process, multiple voting committees, we had an Eurovision style event where we gave Duspoa to the ones we liked. We picked the five we liked. They are Caffeinated Cody, Mike, Von Caffeinator, Go Bean, and Brewster. We like these ones. First of all, thanks to all the other suggestions. Yes. <laughs> They're pretty funny. And we're going to hold a final survey. And uh, our cute Gopher logo is finally going to get a name. Uh, so if you're in the Cup of Go Slack, go check out the latest uh, survey I sent. It's a public vote. On what the name of the cute tiny gopher is going to be. Next week we'll announce the winner. And See you enjoy then. the interview, everyone. Hey, Shy, I'm trying to write the sh- the show notes for this episode, uh, but I can't find the password. Do you have the password for the website? Um, try A. Okay. Try. No, that didn't B. work. B. Uh, no, I don't think it's long enough. Try C. See, no. If only someone here on the call was an expert in fuzzing. Oh, hi, John. Hello. I, I'm not an expert in fuzzing, but maybe I can help you find one. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're more of an expert than shy, so that's probably all we need today. <laughs> and that I've written a fuzz test. So, oh, yeah, some that's, expertise. That's, that's 100% more than I've written, an infinite percent more than I've written. <laughs> so, John, tell us who you are and a little bit about what you do. Uh, I'm John Arundel. I'm a, a writer of books, including Go books, and I also teach Go. I also write Go programs, but I don't get paid for that. Oh, If you remember, uh, a few shows ago, we mentioned and re- recommended John's articles about fuzz testing, uh, which you're writing right now, right? You have like two out of uh, four, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you were more than kind about the articles, which was really just, you know, one of these things where you think, this is a super neat feature of Go that not many people seem to know about. I must tell the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we're already at three out of four, and I'm really, really excited about number four. The first one was random testing, and then fuzz tests, and then writing a Go fast target, and finally, it's about finding bugs. 
or don't build it up too much. It's not that exciting. <laughs> but it's, it's slightly exciting. It's worth reading. It's worth reading. I don't want to yeah. hype it too much. Uh, so if you're a, a long-time listener, you maybe remember we mentioned uh, these articles, and here we have the writer. So welcome, John. Thank you. That's so kind. And I don't want to you know, make too much of it. I didn't invent fuzzing or implement it in Go or anything like that, but I found out about it. And I feel I have a mission to tell the world about neat stuff. That's cool. I'm curious. You said that you teach Go. Um, do you do that online or in person or self-paced courses? How do you teach Go? Yeah, private lessons online. And I also have a course. Okay. Do you work with companies? Let's say I want to take my R&D group and, you know, let's say move them from Python to Go. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be all over that. <laughs> nice. I wanted to ask you about the name of your site. So obviously, if you want to read uh, John's articles or check out his books or any of these kind of things, reach out to him. Uh, I think your main site is bitfieldconsulting.com, right? That's the one. That's a really good name. Like it sticks in my head. But what's the story behind it? Bitfield Consulting. So the consulting part is easy. Yeah, I, I used to be a consultant for a while. And I, I wanted a name that was something consulting, you know, to get that across. And I could have used my name, but that's kind of boring. So I thought it'd be nice if it was a computery word, but also kind of sounds like a name, right? It could be Mr. Bitfield. Oh, sure. You never know. I mean, that would be a neat name if you're an IT consultant. Mr. B it sounds sort of like a James Bond uh, villain. <laughs> Mr. Bitfield. Yeah. Tragically, I found out somebody else had the same idea before me and they got the bitfield.com domain. So oh, shame about that. Tragic. But I'm sure their services are equally good. <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask before we dive deep into, you know, how you teach Go and what experiences you've had there is one more thing about the site. You have a ton of really, really uh, cool icons. Who's doing the, the art? Oh, it's, uh, there's a really nice repo of Go for Tip Art by an artist called Maria Letra, I think cool. is the name. You, you'll find that if you Google for Go for Tip Art or something like that. It's really, really high res ping images and SVGs. So I see a few people using those in the community, but I'm really keen on them. And they make me look great. <laughs> you know, I, I had no input whatsoever into the design of those images, but they're beautiful. Well, there's even a Star Trek one that fits the theme of my, uh, my clip art. I yeah, like and it, it does, lot. sorry, it, it does sort of fit, you know, the idea that I'd like to put across that sort of, you know, some of this material that I'm writing about is a little bit dry, maybe, but we can try and make it fun. I mean, I think that's, that's the best way to learn, isn't it? We learn the easiest when stuff is interesting and fun. I want to, you know, start leading you down a, a track of questions about what's it like teaching Go. But let's start really at the top. Let's say I want to learn uh, Go. Most people come to you, I assume, are not complete juniors, right? Most people you work with already have experience in software development, right? Oh, I think it's a mix. I mean, some people have lots of experience in other languages, maybe, but just not in Go. Some people have lots of experience in Go, but they still feel like there's more to learn. Sure, we all feel like that. And other people just have no experience of any kind of programming at all, but think it's fun and want to try it. So that's great. I like those people the best. <laughs> We've talked a lot about whether Go should be the first language someone learns or always the second language. And we've had various opinions on it. We've had uh, Matt from uh, Boot.dev, who's also teaching Go, but doing it really in an online course with like gamey sort of thing, hold the opinion that Go shouldn't be the first language, I think. And we've had some people on our Slack, I think it's one of the first conversations we had, who were like, Go is such a good language, uh, it's very simple, it's very easy to read. It should be people's first language so they don't learn bad habits that they need to unlearn when they go into Go. Mm. And I'm really curious about your opinion on this uh, sort of idea. That's such a great question. I think I like the implied idea in the question that whether or not it's the first language you learn, Go should not be the last language. <laughs> there is a lot of value in knowing more than one language, right? I mean, that's valuable in itself, no matter what that set of languages is. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, I think I've given this advice sometimes to people who say, you know, what are the 10 languages that I should learn? I say, well, it's, it's nice to have some experience, some exposure to lots of different popular languages. But it's also worth diving deep, I think, into one really deeply, isn't it? Or, or two if you can, but most of us are busy people, so it's hard enough just to do a deep dive into one. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's only when you get to know some language really well, you sort of break through into being able to do good stuff with it. I think so anyway. It's also very circumstantial, right? Like if you have a friend 
that's your gateway into programming and that friend knows, I don't know, Python really well or yeah. PHP really well, it doesn't matter what language you want to learn. You should probably learn this language because, you know, the friend, uh, I don't know, your roommate or whatever, they can help you. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also about what kind of mind you have, isn't it? You know, some mm-hmm. languages are better suited to certain minds than others. I know people who are highly intelligent, but just for whatever reason, Go doesn't seem to suit them, doesn't think the way they do, you know. Mm-hmm. So they're not productive with it. So that's fine. They they should use the language that they like. Yeah, Go definitely has uh, needs to click before you start uh, really working with it. Yeah, I think that's right. And that you can correct me on this, but I sort of get the impression from people I talk to and certainly from myself that most people's first glimpse of Go their opinion is probably not that favorable especially if they're used to other mm. languages like when I when I first saw it I looked always want to look at some code don't you rather than read mm. the publicity stuff and I looked at the code and I thought oh that's ugly <laughs> <laughs> don't like that yeah which is weird because I like C I'm an old school C programmer from the old days and it really does look a lot like C. And I think that was my problem with it. In the, in the meantime, you know, I had affairs with Ruby and Python and other beautiful languages. Something absolutely gorgeous about Ruby, perhaps you'll agree if you've used it, in that you can sort of shape it to be whatever language you want. I haven't used Ruby extensively, so no, I don't know that. Well, whatever way of writing programs appeals to you, you know, object-oriented, imperative, modular, whatever, you can do that in Ruby. You yeah. know, it's so protein, you can kind of do anything with it. Go is definitely not like that, right? We can all agree. It's very opinionated, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, but the thing is, it has all the right opinions. I think that when you first look at Go, it really depends what's your entry point. If you're looking at Go from a curious perspective, you just want to learn something cool, I think it's not as attractive as other options today. Like when you start learning Go, a lot of Go people are about fundamentals. You don't have to import a ton of libraries. The, all the standard tutorials are not about frameworks and libraries and you know, getting huge projects off the ground with tons of uh, files and, and decisions already made for you. It's all about the language is very lean. It's very simple. If, if, you, know, if you want to sort or to get the maximum or minimum of a slice, write it yourself. Here's the four keyword, right? And only yeah. now we're adding the sort into the standard library. By comparison... If you're starting to learn, I don't know, Astro or React or like any of these uh, super heavy Next like uh, or Nuxt or any of these super heavy JavaScript frameworks right now, and the CSS you do with Bootstrap or Tailwind or any of these frameworks, et cetera, et cetera, it feels like you're getting a lot done and you're learning a lot really fast. But I think that, I don't know, two months in, it reverses. So yeah. if you're entering to Go as your company's writing Go or you're doing a Go course, I think these people tend to stick and like Go a lot more, whereas people who start with React and Nux and all these frameworks end up stuck with them or even not liking them very much, but still having to do them and them remaining popular. It's one of the reasons they'll continue doing it. Very true, very true. And I've actually had this experience, you know, training a group of corporate developers. You know, the message from the boss is companies switching to Go. Can you please help train our devs? Certainly, no problem. So I was sort of introducing myself to the group. I'd go around and ask people who they are. i say, you know, why are you interested in learning Go? And the answer was, I'm not. <laughs> and it turned out none of them wanted to learn Go at all. They all thought it was awful and mm-hmm. didn't enjoy the prospect at all. But it, it was like, I'll be fired. So I suppose, right. you know. <laughs> yeah. Why do you want to learn Go? I like eating. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of thinking to myself, boy, tough room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there it is. But whether it should be the first language that you learn to get back to your question i i'm not sure i mean jonathan can maybe weigh in on this as well because he produced some fantastic content introducing go to beginners and it, it's a tough language to teach right i mean there, there are some mm-hmm. really brain-bustingly puzzling things about it i mean sometimes i ask new students what are the things that you feel least confident about in go oh, and yeah. you know exactly what <laughs> they're gonna say right sort of i can imagine yeah pointers is gonna come up mm-hmm certainly concurrency and even things like structs and methods and so forth can like these are fundamental but if they're not present in the language that you come from if you're if you're not used to programming it's it's really hard right it's Mm -hmm. tough to put yourself in the mindset of someone who doesn't know that stuff but that's exactly what teaching is i suppose Mm -hmm. i'm curious john how did you get introduced into go and how long ago was that what was that story like oh that's a good one i think you know i've been programming basically forever but a lot longer than many of your listeners have been alive 
I'm sure. And and some of the interviewers as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when Go was announced, I looked at it, thought that looks ugly, and it's from Google, so no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that's that's my usual hot take on most new languages. It's probably equally bad, you know, clearly that was a wrong take. And I'm sure I'm wrong about lots of other things, but it, it hasn't come back to bite me. So, But I was working as a consultant with a company who switched to Go uh, a few years ago. And they were, and I was thinking to myself, you know, with one eye on the business, sort of thinking, well, if they're all doing Go and I don't know anything about Go, I'm not going to be relevant. So they might think, why are we still paying this guy? You know, what's he for? So I thought, I'd better learn something, you know, get get myself a book and read over the weekend. And consultants are always good at mugging stuff up quickly so they can sound authoritative about it. <laughs> right, right. And uh, I never stopped. Okay. So, that, you know, and I had a really tough time. I don't know whether you did when you first tried to write Go programs, but I think most people find it. I certainly had a hard time with certain aspects of it, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I came from Perl primarily. Um, and so, you know, the idea of, I was using the empty interface everywhere because i didn't know how to think in the right terms you know and go and go away because you know pearl everything's a, a mungible type it's just a thing i want dynamic typing yeah let's just make everything empty <laughs> yeah. interface that'll make my programs much clearer yeah um you know, I, i'm glad i don't do that anymore but that was one of the first mistakes and then trying to to wrap my head around the idea of uh composition instead of inheritance took a while and, and i see that all the time anybody who's learned classical object-oriented programming regardless of the language they have that problem with go all the time yeah for sure uh, i came in from the other side uh, i started working with go as a team leader and in the army you know you're talking about consultants needing to sound uh, authoritative uh, <laughs> imagine getting a, a team of 10 developers that you, you're commanding uh, you haven't used go before you haven't written a web server before and now you're commanding the team right that was rough. I was like trying to understand uh, what I was reading and making decisions. Luckily, the team itself, they were super gracious about it and they taught me everything I needed to know really fast. So my experience with Go was of an initial embarrassment. I came from a like C, C++ background. So structs, I, I read that struct, I was, oh, okay, I'm home. But then I'm like, where's the implements and where's the templating and where are all my features? I need my language to be smarter than me. Why is the language so simple? What are we wasting our time on if we're not trying to figure out the pre-processing macros and templating? Yeah. And I figured that it's just like writing code, like business logic and then making value and stuff like that. Exactly. I mean, I think maybe it's a big advantage in some sense if you're not sort of a computer science professor and you know all about the theory of programming language design and so forth. Because if you did, you'd, you'd be upset with Go thinking, where is everything, right? <laughs> Where's all the good stuff we've been writing papers about for the last 30 years? They seem to have left it out. Maybe they just didn't read the literature. <laughs> yeah, I highly doubt they didn't. They did read it There's... and they didn't like it. <laughs> so they yeah. said, we're not having that. <laughs> So you, you said that you used to be a consultant. I guess that's in the past now. Is teaching and writing about Go your full-time job at this point? Yeah, well, I think I found that the most, the part of the consulting that I always enjoyed most. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who likes to fix problems. I'm sure we all are. Mm -hmm. That's how we got into this. And I found the most enjoyable part of the consulting was sort of teaching people how to fix stuff themselves. I mean, I can parachute in and fix your survey you know but the more interesting thing for me is how do i make it so they don't need to call me back the next time it crashes maybe not a great maybe explains why i wasn't a huge success as a consultant because i never got any repeat business i taught yeah. everybody how to fix their own problems and build a self-healing system and they never needed me. but that's fine um and i found yeah the fun bit for me is teaching people about neat stuff and seeing them get it and the light bulb go on and they get excited and they're like wow i can do a load of cool stuff um, I love that. So I decided I'm just going to do that. Cool. And I guess it's working well for you. So that nice to have a success story. Yeah, I still really enjoy it. It's so much fun. You know, I, I realized after a while, there's only so much, you know, there's only one of me. <laughs> I can't mm -hmm. sort of, can't teach everybody. So if I want to reach more people, I'd better write a book. So that's why I did that. And now you have many of them. Yeah, you did that seven times. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, it actually works really well because, as you know, when you've tried to teach Go to people or help them solve problems, you sort of need to find the right way of phrasing something, don't you? Like with each individual person, there's some kind of idea or form of words that just helps them get it. You probably won't find that straight away. You might need to try a few different ways. I mean, I've tried a zillion ways of explaining pointers and <laughs> I, th I still think mm -hmm. I can't explain it very well, but I'm getting them. Um, so, you know, working with students helps me refine that stuff and I, I see what works and what doesn't work 
and figure out mm-hmm. the right order to introduce these concepts. Like, you know, what do you need to understand before you go on to the next thing and so on? And then, yep. you know, that, that can go in the books. So in the books, it just looks as though I got it right first time and like, here's the logical way to understand Go. <laughs> but, and also the process of doing that, you know how it is. If you ever write and publish something, you don't want to look like an idiot. So you do your research, you read up on this stuff, you check out the facts. And I learn a ton of stuff. Course, doing that yeah. so when, back when i was a consultant i wanted to learn about puppet you know i thought the way to do this is i'll write a book on puppet and then i'll have to learn something won't i <laughs> yeah. uh, and it worked with go as well. well that's one of the reasons we started this podcast is to help each of us individually keep up to date with what's happening at go so forces us to learn about the go news so that we can tell the audience what the go news is yeah and we've had uh, another author on the show uh, adelina simian who she wrote the tdd book yeah, um, that's wonderful. And and she said exactly the same. She like she was like I started uh, writing it. I learned so much about testing, so much more than I thought uh, I I was able to share. So it's definitely the best way to learn is to teach. That's really cool. I think you you really highlight that that programming is fun. That was exactly my next thing. I, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned in a few places, prominent places, that you think programming is fun and uh, people should have fun. While I I totally agree with you. Many times, especially, you know, working corporate or or big organizations or stuff like that, that's not the focus point. Like if you would ask 50 VP R&Ds right now, especially, you know, not when the interest is uh, 0%, but uh, when the economy looked what it looks like, what do they care about in their uh, employees right now? I think they would say velocity, quality, and I think they would get to, you know, them showering before them having fun. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, so it's, I'm wondering why it's so highlighted for you. Well, I know it sounds like one of these motherhood and apple pie things, like who doesn't think programming is fun? But as you say, VPs don't. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of working programmers that I meet don't feel it's fun. That's mm-hmm. partly because perhaps when I was a little kid, you know, I would play with computers and write programs in basic and things like that and just never stopped doing that really so it started as fun for me and thankfully has never stopped being. but a lot of people i think they just see it as you know it's a it's a decent career well paid the right sort of set of skills to learn isn't it and they they go into it but perhaps i to be careful what i say perhaps they spend their whole life sort of programming type script frameworks and things and there's, there's not a whole lot of fun for them so they just think ah this profession kind of sucks you know mm-hmm. i think that's such a shame and also, I've noticed the students I have who make the quickest progress and become the best software developers are the ones who are having fun. The more fun they're having, the better programs they're writing, and the more programs they write, so the better they get at it. I mean, if something's not fun, you're not going to do it. Fair point. So that's why I... Totally. That's why I sort of play that up in that I sort of, A, want to remind people, hey, you know, yeah, we, it's nice to get a check, but, you know, we're basically doing this because it's enjoyable. Mm. If we didn't enjoy it, that would be a real shame because you're going to spend your life doing this stuff. So <laughs> if it's not fun, yeah. hard luck. And the, 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 other, the other reason to say it is, you know, perhaps some people are thinking, uh, John must be dumb because, you know, it's not always fun programming. What if you've got some really awful bug or you have some horrendous code base with no tests and you have to fix something? What about that, John? <laughs> How are you going to make that fun? You know, let's see what you got. My answer to that is sort of, well... You make a good point, imaginary interlocutor. But, <laughs> but but my question would be, how did we get into that situation in the first place? Right? Like why why are we in this very no fun situation? Is it because we don't have tests or whatever? That's quite common, isn't it? And often the reason we don't have tests is we don't really have a very clear idea of what this program is supposed to do. Mm-hmm. That's more common than people might think, isn't it? Or that the original uh, developers didn't have fun when they started. I think a, a, a big part of having fun when programming is, is enjoying your profession, like feeling smart, solving problems, being proud of what you build. And it's something that gets lost when you use frameworks and work in a super large company and have deadlines and you develop software that's shipped immediately and not in a box with your name on it but if you mess up you just ship another thing tomorrow in a SaaS model and you know everybody's used to getting bugs all the time yeah that's so true i mean we're all all working with constraints aren't we but the, the thing is i sort of think if if you come in with the attitude like this is i'm doing a fun creative thing this is enjoyable and i'm good at it um you can have fun within those constraints you know you can still do a good job even if you feel you're being rushed or pressured or stressed or whatever you can just say well let's push back on that for a moment and just say given the time scope etc that i have what's the best job i can do so john uh we've talked about beginning with go uh we talked about making go fun uh programming fun in general what advice would you have to somebody who's 
maybe thinking about going this route or our listeners probably are trying go, but some of them might not be enjoying it or they're struggling with it. What advice would you have for these people? How can they maybe get over that hump? Oh, nice question. I think I would tell them the same thing that I suggest to my students, which is the way, best way to learn is by writing some programs. The best way to do that is have some program that you want or are interested in. Maybe it's some subject area that you think is cool, like cryptography or networking or databases or whatever, but you, you can... Think of something that you could write in that space. Just try to do it. But ideally, if it's some real program that you actually need in your daily life, maybe your personal life, work life or whatever, this is the joy of computing, isn't it? That you can build programs to do things instead of you doing them. So if you can find something like that, that really helps because then it's not an exercise. You know, it's like if you're a musician, you know, it's like it's not, not like practicing scales all day long. So you also need to play music. In fact, that's the best way. Nice. Good advice. Yeah. There are many interesting side projects that uh, people can take. I know that Jonathan and I often recommend uh, doing things that all three of us are doing on this uh, call, uh, which is content creation, writing a blog. <laughs> we really, really, really encourage you. If, you. if you listen to the other John's advice right now and you're wondering, what should I do? I don't have any project immediately in mind. Uh, grab a notebook, think about it for a second. And if you can't come up with anything, just start writing blog posts about the libraries you've learned, uh, follow up on some links, talk to some people, uh, and share the content with us. Yeah, that's such great advice. And also, you know, please don't wait until you feel like you're an expert in the subject before you're allowed to blog about it. I certainly have not. And if I yeah. if I ever become an expert, I'll let you know. But please, <laughs> please learn in public because that is actually the most valuable kind of content for people who are learning is to see what puzzles other people and how they solved it, right? Yeah. I, they, our listeners don't know, but probably uh, Filippo knows. Filippo, our editor, knows it very well, where we, we'll have like a new library coming out or a new version of Go. And we manage these news in like we have a Trello board where we ma- manage all the things and we assign that this one's uh, this news item Jonathan is doing this news item i am doing and usually it's the other way around like if jonathan brought something to the table that he knows about then i'll have to present it because we the whole point of the show <laughs> is us learning right uh and sharing our learning with the community and you know everything that filippo has to edit out that's not like something is happening or we're uh, we're sneezing or something is like okay so this new version of the library came out and oh wait i have no idea what it is give me a second <laughs> <laughs> A lot so, of edit. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we added these parts out. It's reassuring. And I've also found when pairing with my students, that usually they drive, you know, and I'll sort of kip it from the sidelines. But it's, it's nice for me to drive sometimes because they see me making a ton of mistakes. You know, mm-hmm. I, I forget mm-hmm. things in the standard library or, or get compile errors or make typos and things. And I, I think they see that and feel a bit more relaxed because they're like, hey, that guy knows what he's doing and he's making mistakes. <laughs> I'm operating at the same level as he is, you know. That's terrific. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We all have only 24 hours and, uh, you know, t- 10 uh, fingers to click on the keyboard. All programmers. We, we have the same constraints. Uh, great. So coming to a close here, we usually have two questions that we ask uh, every interviewee, and we would love to pick your brains about it as well. Let's say, gun to your head, you have to remove a feature from Go. <laughs> what would it be? Yeah, this is a nice one. I, I carefully listened to all your previous episodes, so I wouldn't say anything that somebody else oh, said. But nice. I actually think I could probably dispense with quite a few things in Go. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you've probably seen it. Matt Ryer did a great talk on, I think it was, Things I Never Use in Go. It's on YouTube. You can find it. And among those were at least four of the keywords and a few other things. And the thing is, Jonathan, when you're writing your excellent roundup of Go books, you talked about my friend John Bodner's excellent book, Learning Go. Mm-hmm. That is really terrific. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'm furious about it because it's the book I really wanted to write and he did it. So, <laughs> um, But nonetheless, and you said one thing he does is he covers everything. You know, it is comprehensive. If it's in Go, it's in that. And mm-hmm. I, I haven't done that with my books and that's on purpose because I found if you try to teach people everything, they just don't take it in, right? It's too much. So I politely don't mention things which in fact they won't really need to know about. Complex number types <laughs> built into Go. <laughs> You know, did you ever use yeah. these? I didn't. I mean, if you're a physicist, you probably Never. did. Yeah. Yep. Never. <laughs> but, I mean, need, needless to say, I, I don't use GoTo. There's not, mm-hmm. <laughs> not much call for that. There are one or two um, times if you read the standard library code and the Go runtime code and the compiler, which I definitely recommend. I mean, this, this is a fun recreation. 
um, as long as no one's going to quiz you on it, you know, <laughs> if you just read <laughs> yeah. it for enjoyment. Um, you sometimes see go to use, and then they'll sort of stop and figure out, like, obviously they know what they're doing. So is there a good reason for this? Oh, I guess there is, you know, because it's awkward to break out of this loop, three nested loops or something like this. But, you know, mm-hmm. we, we probably shouldn't have go to just in case someone uses it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think something that causes no end of pain and confusion, at least for my students, is... Um, the colon equals short declaration form, right? You know, mm-hmm. this is, even the Go designers themselves, I think, have said that was probably a mistake, but it just seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, because, you know, you can introduce shadowing and you can get this weird effect if you're assigning two variables, like something and er. Maybe one of those is already defined, but the other one isn't. Yeah. I always thought about the, the walrus operator as more of a branding move than a computer science move. It's like the first thing you need to do usually in programming, uh, you know, tutorials, it's hello world, right? And then you put the hello in a, in a variable and you print that. Uh, and then you're like, oh, Go has the walrus operators. Okay, that's how this language is different. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love it because I would be super annoyed to have to write vars and should such equals every time. You know, that's mm-hmm. no fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it, it just, this happens a lot, doesn't it? That something that seems like a really nice free extra bonus feature just introduces confusion because now there's two ways to do it and people say well should i use colon equals or should i use var or whatever and now you have to know about that and the other thing is anytime you get some really weird really horrible bug in your go program it's probably either due to a channel right or a, mm. <laughs> or a deadlock or it's some something to do with the walrus operator having shadowed some other variable inside a loop or something. Yeah, when you yeah. defer a thing and you up, you declared it in one way. We we covered something recently. I think it was time since. You shouldn't defer the time since things. Right. Um, it's, it's uh, I think that the fact that uh, you get these bugs in Go is maybe more of an achievement of the language than yeah. a, I mean, a drawback. Because yeah. you wouldn't even get to these bugs so fast in... Uh, <laughs> In uh, languages, in other languages, at least in my experience. Oh, definitely. I mean, you can make too much of this, can't you? You can say, oh, there's a, there's a construct in Go that allows you to write bad programs. Shock horror. Yeah. <laughs> you know, thank goodness no other languages have those. Yeah. So you pretty much uh, covered the entire field for the rest of our interviews because you said everything <laughs> in every single book uh, should stay. And other than these uh, tons of features, so all our next interviews, all they have to do is either agree or disagree with right. you. But here's a more open-ended one. If you could uh, cop a feature from a different language uh, and put it into Go, what would the feature library, I don't know, community thing, whatever, uh, what would that be? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I definitely think there's scope for multiple languages, as we started out by saying, isn't there? Because some languages, the philosophy is let's put everything in and then people can just use the bits they like, C++. Um, Mm -hmm. Other languages, or a small group of languages, but Go is one of them, isn't it? The designers evidently felt, let's take away everything we can (laughs) until there's Mm -hmm. just enough left to be able to write useful programs. And if you need other constructs, you can build them in the language. So Lisp is the ultimate version of that, isn't it? It's basically nothing except brackets and um, <laughs> yeah. eval and apply. But Go is clearly, like, you know, they explicitly said they started with C and took out the bad bits, didn't they? I mm-hmm. think that's that's great, and I love that philosophy. And I actually think it carries over into our programs as well. It's that Go, the language, is sort of sitting there looking at you saying, I'm really minimalist. Shouldn't your programs be the same? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, stop building so much and over-abstracting and all of this kind of thing. So I, I love the fact that Go hasn't felt the need to include, you know, every neat idea from every other language. They stole a load of excellent ideas from other great languages, but they stole just the right ones with very good taste, all you can ask for. So I genuinely don't think there's anything that I would want to add to Go. I think I'm in the minority here. In fact, I'm sure I am. But every time the survey comes around and they said, what bugs are you the most that it's missing from Go? And I'm just like, I can't think of anything, you know, it's I, uh, I seem to be able to get by with Go as it is just fine. And even generics, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, it sounds neat, but never felt the lack of it. But now they're here. Hey, let's use them to build neat stuff. Yeah. Good answer. Nothing. <laughs> nice answer. <laughs> Cool. Well, John, it has been a pleasure having you on. Um, I read your book uh, several months ago. It's nice to finally meet you. Um, so thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing your wisdom with our listeners. How can people, uh, just one last time, how can people reach out to you if they're interested in, uh, in getting in contact? Uh, just go to bitfield doc, bitfieldconsulting.com and you'll find me. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks Talk a lot. See you all next time. 
a big thanks to John for coming on the show. Uh, thanks, I first, John. I first became aware of John when I was reviewing books for Go Beginners. I had scoured Amazon, and his books weren't there. Uh, and the reason is because they're self-published. So one of my readers or, or watchers, uh, I published on YouTube and uh, on my blog, pointed me to his books. So I checked out his books, and they were great. And and especially if you're a beginner to programming in general, his book, For the Love of Go, is a, is a great book. Uh, and he's a fun guy to talk to, very knowledgeable, and has some, some great insights to share with us. So thanks, John, for coming on. And thanks for everything you're doing for the Go community in general, uh, and just the programming community, even in a larger sense. So really appreciate that. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, we need more friendly people like John in the in the industry. I really recommend checking out his uh, Twitter, his LinkedIn and whatever and specifically, you know, drop into bitfieldconsulting.com, grab an article and read it. Uh, they're all good and I'm sitting on the edge of my seat here. Well, actually that's a lie. Uh, Jonathan knows that I have a standing desk, so I'm standing. Yeah. But but I'm standing on the on the tip of my toes here. Uh, waiting for his final uh, fuzzing blog. Three are already out, so if you haven't got on the hype train yet, go read them. And if you, like Jonathan, haven't written a fuzz test yet, go <laughs> or go write one. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, join us for the final article, which is coming soon. Very good. Thanks a lot, John. Talk to you all next week. Have a great week. Bye.